Hello, and welcome to Lessons in History. The hello today is just what went on in World War I. Today, we will focus on the causes, the stalemate, and how Germany ended up being the runners-up of the First World War. This is going to be a mammoth of a video, so please make sure that you look in the comments to the area that you find most tricky. By 1900, Britain was the world's richest country, and the British Empire was the largest the world had ever seen. This was one of the reasons why such a small island was viewed as such a powerful nation. Through her marriage to Albert, and other marriages of her children, Queen Victoria and the royal family was directly connected to the rulers of Russia, Germany, Spain, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Greece and Romania. Despite having wealth and power, Britain was divided, a rich nation and a poor nation. Richer people enjoyed a life of luxury, while the poor barely earned enough money to get by, linked to your medicine course. Britain had the largest shipbuilding industry, but produced less goods individually than the other nations. Before 1871, there was no such country as Germany. It was a collection of small states or areas that shared similar customs and were united together in 1871 following a series of wars between Prussia and nearby France, Austria and Denmark. The new Germany made rapid social, military and economic progress. Wilhelm II, the German Kaiser, was the grandson of Britain's Queen Victoria and the cousin of Britain's future King George V. He was a dictator with complete power, despite having a parliament to assist him. Germany's empire was small compared with both Britain and France's, but by the 20th century, it was recognised as having the finest army in the world. In 1871, the French were beaten by the German forces in the Franco-Prussian War, which was a blow to their pride. France didn't have a ruling royal family like many other leading European powers, but it was a republic as a result of the French Revolution. A republic is a nation ruled by an elected president with the help of elected politicians. Many French politicians had a long-standing hatred for Germany and wanted revenge for the Franco-Prussian War. The French Empire was the second largest behind that of Britain's. France was one of the world's leading trading nations, but was beginning to fall behind many other nations, including Britain and Germany, in the production of goods and materials such as coal, steel, ships and food. Russia was by far the largest country in Europe, hashtag is it really in Europe, actually geography teacher, but didn't have any overseas colonies. Russia was a nation of both great wealth and extreme poverty. The rich owned the best land and the vast majority of Russians were illiterate peasants under the control of wealthy landowners. Ruled by an emperor known as a Tsar, Tsar Nicholas II and his wife Alexandria were distant cousins of both Kaiser Wilhelm II, the German emperor, and George V of Great Britain. From 1904 to 1905, Russia fought and lost a war with Japan in the Russo-Japanese War. The country remained very unstable, strikes became more frequent, and the Tsar responded with increasing force. The union between Austria and Hungary had taken place in 1867. Austria-Hungary was a nation of many different nationalities and dozens of different languages were spoken. Think of the British Empire as forced together in one geographical location. Now you're getting the idea. Many of these groups wanted independence from Austria-Hungary, much like those in the British Empire, eventually. Overall political authority was held by Emperor Franz Josef, not Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Austria-Hungary also did not have any overseas colonies. The task of keeping Austria-Hungary unified was one of the government's biggest problems in the years leading up to the First World War. The Czechs in the north and the Croats in the southwest wanted to rule themselves and Serbs living in the south wanted to join with the evil empire from their point of view, that is Serbia. Serbia itself was becoming increasingly more powerful and was a strong ally of Russia. In the years leading up to the First World War, some of the most powerful countries in Europe had divided into two opposing sides or alliances. In one alliance were Germany, Austria-Hungary and Italy, the Triple Alliance or the Central Powers. The other, the Triple Entente was made up of France, Russia and Britain. Let's be very clear, there was no three-way between France, Russia and Britain, and this is why it is very important to understand how the alliance systems were formed. In 1879, the dual alliance is formed between Germany and Austria-Hungary, as they were natural allies given their shared language, culture and history. In 1882, the dual alliance becomes the triple alliance between Germany, Austria-Hungary and Italy. Each country promised to provide military support to the other if one was attacked by two other powers. Italy was viewed as a minor partner. In 1892, 
Franco-Russian alliance between the French and the Russians was signed. France, determined to protect itself against Germany after the Franco-Prussian War, so signed a deal with Russia to help each other in case of war. In 1904, the Entente Cordiale, or the friendly understanding between Britain and France, was signed. Formed due to increasing threat of German growing military and naval expansion in South Africa, Britain thought it important to settle colonial disputes with the French. Let's be clear, this was not, this was not, for the third time, this was not a military agreement. This was an act between Britain and France to respect each other's colonies. And finally, in 1907, the Triple Entente between France, Russia and Britain was an amalgamation of the Franco-Russian alliance and the Entente Cordiale. Now the causes of the First World War has its own video, so make sure to check that out for the specific details to help you with the 16 mark question. Now let's go through an overview of the Moroccan crises, the Balkan and Bosnian crisis, splendid isolation, Kaiser Wilhelm II, the arms race, the Black Hand, the murder in Sarajevo, countdown to war and overall the summary of the causes of the First World War. Morocco was one of the few areas of Africa that had not been colonised by a European country. Britain had agreed to support France's attempt to take them over as part of the Entente Cordiale. Germany's Emperor, Kaiser Wilhelm II, was determined to prevent this from happening and visited Tangier to pledge his support for a Moroccan ruler. Tensions built up between France and Germany at the Al Krakas Conference in January 1906, which was held to settle the conflict. This was humiliating for Germany and led to the formation of the Triple Entente. 1911 saw the second crisis in Morocco when there was a local rebellion in Fez. The Sultan asked the French for help, who sent 20,000 soldiers to fight the rebels. Germany accused the French of invading Morocco and had sent a warship, the Panther, as a show of strength. Eventually, a series of meetings were held between German, French and British politicians and a peaceful solution was found. German humiliation once again. Britain and France grew closer. Italy hadn't supported Germany, which weakened the Triple Alliance. Britain, now convinced Germany were a threat to European peace and in 1912 signed a secret military agreement, specifically focusing on the navy with France to protect the sea against Germany. Serbia was the leading Slav state in the Balkans and wanted to unite all Slavs into one nation known as Pan-Slavism. In 1908, Austria-Hungary took control of Bosnia, known as the Bosnian Crisis, which was a small Slav state that had been previously under Turkish control, which angered the Serbians, and they asked Russia in turn to take action. Russia called for an international conference to discuss the actions of Austria-Hungary. Germany supported Austria-Hungary. Russia faced a dilemma. Should it stand up for Serbia and take on Germany and Austria-Hungary or back down? For now, Russia did so. It backed down because it was not prepared to risk a war and it felt it was not strong enough to take on Germany at this time. As a result of the Bosnian crisis, several secret societies were formed in Serbia and in Bosnia with the main aim to get rid of Austria-Hungarian influence in the Balkans. They were prepared to use violence to achieve this. Unity or death was their motto. They were known as the Black Hand. Russia vowed also that they would not back down again against Germany. Britain and splendid isolation. Britain had the biggest empire and naturally wanted to protect it. In 1889, Britain passed a law stating that its navy should be at least as large as their next two largest navy combined. This was known as the two power standard. Britain felt that it didn't need any military or economic allies as they were so huge both in terms of the navy and in empire so it had all the resources that it needed. This was known as splendid isolation, living peacefully without any consideration for the rest of the world, specifically Europe, to stay out of European affairs. It began, however, to look less great in the early 1900s, when most of the European nations begin to split themselves into two distinct alliances. With Germany becoming increasingly aggressive, Britain was looking a little too isolated, therefore. In 1904, the Entente Cordiale was signed between Britain and France. In 1907, they joined the Triple Entente with France and Russia and ended splendid isolation. Kaiser Wilhelm II felt that Germany should be a global power, with a large empire and control over colonies in different parts of the world. This was known as Weltpolitik, 
meaning world policy. Any of the international actions that Germany took, all of those on the world stage, come under this one term. Welt, not Welt, Weltpolitik. To protect his new empire, the Kaiser wanted a large navy of powerful battleships. His aims and actions increased the tension between European nations. Desire for more colonies alarmed countries that already had empires of their own. Cough, cough, Britain. They wondered whether the Kaiser would challenge them for their colonies, which could lead to war. The fact that he kept building up his army and navy only increased tensions. Other nations began to build up their own armies and navies in response, and drew up detailed defence plans and attack plans in preparation for war. This is when most of the powerful European nations began to form alliances. An arms race is when rival countries build up their armed forces to become bigger and stronger than any other. In the years leading up to the First World War, the major European powers took part in an arms race and spent millions on their military. In 1870, Britain, France, Germany, Austria-Hungary, Russia and Italy spent over £90 million between them. But, by 1914, this had quadrupled to almost £400 million. Britain was the only major power that had not introduced conscription by the time war broke out in 1914, and instead relied on volunteers until 1916. These were known as Kitchener's Army. European powers were so worried about future conflicts that they made detailed battle plans of where and when to attack. The naval arms race between Britain and Germany came as a result of Kaiser Wilhelm II's desire to have a grand navy. The Kaiser announced he wanted a navy to rival Britain, who was currently the world's greatest naval power, as a result of things like the Two Power Standard. Britain announced its creation of the Dreadnought, a new, improved type of warship, in 1906. To give you some perspective, this machine had 10 12-inch guns. By 12-inch, the bullet is not 12-inch, no, 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 no. The diameter of the shell is 12 inches. It also went at 24 miles an hour, so it's a nice easy number to remember. The creation of the Black Hand came as a direct consequence of the Bosnian crisis. Individuals from all walks of life, those that were Slavs, were willing to act out acts of terrorism in order to create a pan-Slavic state. Archduke Franz Ferdinand, Franz Josef's nephew, planned to visit Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia, on June 28, 1914, which was seen as a direct insult to Serbia, as this was a national day. The Black Hand planned his assassination. Gavriel Princip, a 19-year-old student, shot Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his pregnant wife Sophie. Now let's be very clear, a lot of students do say that the assassination caused World War I. Well then why didn't war break out the next day, on the 29th of June 1914? Why did it take a long, long time? Britain didn't even get involved until August, so what went on? Well, we have the July crisis and the countdown to war. Most European powers thought that the Sarajevo murder was a local matter that would be dealt with by the countries involved. Oh, this was not the case. In July 1914, after checking it had the support of Germany, Austria-Hungary sent a list of demands known as the 10-point ultimatum to Serbia. They were given 48 hours to respond. It would have been impossible for the Serbians to have accepted this. It would have resulted in Austro-Hungarians having control over the legislature as a result of Serbia not accepting the conditions, the impossible conditions of the Austro-Hungarians. The Austro-Hungarians declared war. An attack they did. Coming to Serbia's rescue was Russia, and on Wednesday the 29th of July 1914 they mobilised their army. On the 30th of July 1914, Germany's alliance with Austria-Hungary kicked into force. The Kaiser asked his cousin, Tsar Nicholas of Russia, to stop getting his troops ready. Saturday, the 1st of August, Tsar Nicholas refuses to stop preparations for war, as they said they would never back down again. Germany mobilises its army and declares war on Russia. The French prepare for war, an ally, remember. Of Russia. Sunday the 2nd of August 1914, Germany begins its first part of the Schlieffen Plan and asks for passage through Belgium to France, but it is refused. Monday the 3rd of August 1914, Germany declares war on France and invades Belgium. This brings Britain into the conflict as they had signed a treaty in 1839, known as the Treaty of London, promising to protect little Belgium if it was invaded. Why are you getting involved, Britain? Britain asked Germany to call off the invasion of Belgium. They did not. Tuesday, the 4th of August, Germany did not respond to Britain, and at 11pm, 
Britain declares war on Germany. Hashtag, this is the end of the British Empire. This was a mistake. No. Why? We could have been living on the moon. It still annoys me to this day. Why did they get involved? World War II. Fine. Stop Nazi persecution. Fine. Nothing to do with Britain. Please. Why? I should cut that bit out. Wednesday the 5th of August 1914. France declares war on Germany. Thursday, the 6th of August, 1914, Austria-Hungary declares war on Russia. Together, the weeks after the assassination is known as the July Crisis. Okay, let's put the causes of the First World War to one side and actually go into the war now that things have kicked off. Created in December 1905, Count Alfred von Schlieffen, the most senior general in the German army, designed a plan. A plan that changed over many years. It was designed to deal with a war on two fronts. Following the signing of the Franco-Russian alliance, simply it was decided that it hinged on one simple principle, that it would take Russia several weeks to mobilise its army and therefore give Germany time to beat France. The plan involved several similar smaller groups of German soldiers entering through Belgium, going to France and attack its northern regions, marching all the way to control Paris. It was expected that most French troops would be positioned on the German border, so therefore the Germans would have an element of surprise and the French would be outflanked and surrounded. Schlieffen's plan's success relied heavily on the defeat of Belgium and quick victory over the French. The Germans underestimated, however, that the Belgians who put up a much fiercer resistance than expected. They had built a series of huge stone forts equipped with long-range powerful guns. This delayed the German invasion of France by four or five days. Also, they were slowed at the Mons where the British Expeditionary Force, the BEF, pinned down a large number of German troops. Delay forced the Germans to abandon abandon Paris and capture it. The Schlieffen plan relied on the Russians taking six weeks to mobilise their armies, but it only took ten days. In response, Germans ordered around 100,000 soldiers to leave the war in France to take on the Russians in the east. Germany now was fighting the one thing it did not want, a war on two fronts. That was the purpose of the Schlieffen plan. It was designed not to win the war, but to simply avoid a war on two fronts. German troops under General von Kluck swerved southeast and marched into the valley of the River Marne. This gave the British and the French an opportunity to attack. Following the Battle of the Marne, it became clear that the Schlieffen plan had failed. It is vital that to understand the stalemate, you have to appreciate what is termed the race to the sea. By early September 1914, both sides had dug trenches to defend themselves. Neither side could go forward, so they each tried to get around the back of another or to outflank them to use the correct term. As the armies marched forward, trying to outflank each other, they dug trenches as they went. Sometimes this is called this vital term, the race to the sea. From the 19th of October to the 22nd of November, over 120,000 British, French and Belgian soldiers, shoulders, shoulders, difficult word, leave me alone, soldiers were killed or wounded at the Battle of Ypres. Or the British soldiers, fun fact, called wipers because they don't know how to pronounce it. Do you know how to pronounce it? I like calling it wipers. I think it sounds better and it's more English. While stopping the Germans from outflanking them. By November 1914, both sides had reached the English Channel. Lines of trenches soon stretched the other way too, eventually reaching the coast of Switzerland over 400 miles. For the next four years, these positions hardly changed, and this was soon referred to as a stalemate, a complete inability to move forward any great distance and a solid determination not to be pushed back. War of movement was over and trench warfare had begun. The Russian army marched towards Germany and Austria-Hungary within days of the war. Over one million soldiers and nicknamed the Steamroller. By mid-August, they advanced several hundred miles into German territory. The Russians were poorly equipped and badly led. Beaten by the Germans at the infamous Battle of Tannenberg on the 26th to the 30th of August 1914, at Tannenberg they lost 125,000 men. They did, however, have more success against the Austro-Hungarians, with the Austro-Hungarians advancing well into Russian territory, but fled when they faced nearly half a million Russian soldiers. In less than a week, the Austro-Hungarians had retreated over 120 miles. Estimates of 100,000 killed and 220,000 wounded and 100,000 captured. Numbers, numbers, numbers. The Russians crossed the border into Austria-Hungary but met with a mountain range they slowed. The Eastern Front began to take shape over the remaining few months. The most frequent weapons used in the First World War are artillery, machine guns, gas attack, rifle bayonets, grenades and flamethrowers, as well as tanks. The artillery was the name given to large guns that fire bombs or shells 
over a long distance. Machine guns became well known as a deadly weapon during the First World War. Gas attacks were first used in April 1915 by the Germans. A rifle was a standard issue, such as a Lee Enfield. A bayonet was a 40 centimetre knife attached to the end of the rifle. The purpose of tanks was a British invention that was bulletproof and first used in 1916. Now there is a specific video on my channel about the three key battles on the Western Front, so make sure to check that out. The first one was the Battle of Verdun, fought from February to December 1916. It was the longest battle of the First World War and took place in hills north of Verdun, in northeastern France. Verdun was regarded as the strongest city in France. Falkenhayn, the commander of the German army, wanted to bleed France white so that so many would die that they would be forced into surrender. The German assault began on the 21st of February. By the 24th, the French had retreated to the third line of trenches just eight kilometers from Verdun. General Joffrey was replaced by General Philippe Patin, who ordered every spare French soldier to Verdun. Over the next five months, tons of supplies and thousands of soldiers poured into Verdun. Fighting followed the pattern of attack and counter-attack until the autumn. Size of German attacks reduced as the British had launched major attacks on German troops at the River of the Somme by the request of the French to hopefully relieve some of the pressure at Verdun, and also an attack by the Russians on the Eastern Front meant that German troops were needed there too. Germany called off their attack. French lost more men than the Germans, but thought of themselves as the winners. The Battle of the Somme took place between July and November 1916. British and French fought against the German forces. It was the largest battle of the First World War on the Western Front, with more than 3 million men taking part. Around 1 million were wounded or killed in making it one of the bloodiest battles that had ever taken place in human history. It had been planned since the summer of 1915, in the hope of breaking the stalemate. Britain had 1 million fresh recruits following a major recruitment campaign. When the Germans attacked at Verdun, Britain led an attack at the Somme to draw troops away. On the 24th of June 1916, British and French artillery began a huge bombardment of German trenches. On the 1st of July 1916, the first wave of British soldiers went over the top. Britain suffered 60,000 casualties on the first day, with 20,000 fatalities, the highest number of casualties and deaths ever recorded in a single day of the British Army. Despite losses, Hay continued to send men over the top, but major breakthrough he hoped for never happened. Attacks stopped in November due to the approaching winter. British and French troops gained a strip of land about 25 kilometers long and 6 kilometers wide, but at the cost of 620,000 men, with the Germans losing around half a million. Sir Douglas Hay, commander of the British Army, was criticized after the battle and nicknamed the Butcher of the Somme. You may commonly hear phrases such as lions, meaning the soldiers, the Tommies, led by donkeys. The Battle of Passchendaele also known as the Third Battle of Eeps, or Wipers, took place from July to November 1917. Fought between Britain against the German forces for control of hills south and east of the Belgian city of Wipers. Well known for not only the number of casualties, but also for the muddy ground upon which the battle was fought. Wipers had been the site of battles in 1914 and in 1915, hence the term the Third Battle of Wipers. General Haig was convinced he could achieve a quick breakthrough and then advance north to capture the Belgian port which were being used by the Germans as submarine bases. The assault began on the 18th of July with artillery bombardment of over 4.5 million shells lasting for around 10 days. The area had seen the heaviest rainfall in 30 years and exploding bombs turned the ground to a sea of thick sticky mud filled with deep craters. When the ground attack began on the 31st of July, the troops had to carry boards and lay them down in front of them in an attempt to get over the mud. Within a week, the British had lost 30,000 men. The British attacked a again and again, and by October the fighting had reached the village of Passchendaele, about 8 kilometers from the starting point. Attacks called off in November as conditions on the battlefield were growing worse. 400,000 soldiers from Britain and its empire were killed and injured. The Germans lost over 300,000 soldiers. Haig's reputation was further discredited. Gallipoli. Soon after war broke out in 1914, Turkey, or the Ottoman Empire, joined on the German side. Before long, Turkey and Russia were fighting each other in the Caucasus mountain regions, and the Russian generals appealed to their French and British allies for help. If Britain and France could get control of the Dardanelles, they would be able to get supplies to Russia by sea. As well as opening up a sea route, the British felt that an attack on Turkey would distract the Germans. Churchill, head of the British Navy, believed that an attack on Turkey would mean that the Germans would have to send soldiers to help, which would give the British and the French troops a chance to mount huge attacks and break enemy lines. Remember, always, the purpose of these attacks is to break the stalemate. 
Also, he hoped a quick defeat of Turkey would mean other countries near Turkey, such as Greece, Bulgaria and Romania, would join in on Britain's side and attack Austria-Hungary. Remember, defeat of Austria-Hungary would leave Germany isolated. The Gallipoli campaign and the plan was divided into three phases. Phases 1 and 2 were a naval campaign, while phase 3 was a military campaign on land, mainly Anzac, Australian and New Zealand Army Corps troops. Attack by Anzac troops went badly wrong. Thousands were gunned down within minutes of leaving their boats. On the 12th of December, troops were secretly led away at night to waiting boats by the British military leaders. Gallipoli campaign is regarded as a failure, but there were some achievements. It was a failure in regards that Turkey was not knocked out of the war. Bulgaria joined Germany and Churchill resigned, and over 200,000 Allied deaths. The Russians remained short of supplies as there was no way to connect the Western Allies to Russia. However, in some ways it's a success. As a campaign, it diverted Turks away from helping Germany or Austria-Hungary on the Western Front. No troops died during the evacuation. A few British submarines managed to get through the Dardanelles and sink Turkish warships. Both sides knew it was vital to control the seas. Firstly, so they could protect boats bringing in supplies, and secondly, to stop supplies getting to its enemy. In November 1914, the British declared that the North Sea was a war zone, and that any ship entering it did so at their own risk. This stopped ships reaching Germany, which had a devastating effect on industry, food, and medical supplies. Both sides were cautious with their navies. In May 1916, saw one of the major sea battles at Jutland. Germany hatched a plan to bring British ships out into the open so they could take them on. The plan failed as British troops had captured a German code book in 1914 and could decode all of the radio messages. Britain lost 14 ships and 6,100 sailors. Germany lost 9 ships and 2,500 sailors. Germany claimed it was a victory, but the British pointed out that the German fled the area at the first battle. Their fleet needed major repairs before it could sail again, and they made no impact on the blockade. After Jutland, there were no more large naval battles for the rest of the war. The Germans relied more and more on their submarines or U-boats to wage war against their enemy. U-boats sank on average two supply ships a day. In May 1915, a German U-boat sunk a British passenger liner, the Lusitania, which contained 128 Americans in increased tensions between the US and German governments. By February 1916, Germany had built over 100 U-boats and another series of attacks began. 500 supply ships heading for Britain were destroyed in eight weeks and by April, Britain was said to only have six weeks of food supply left. The British responded by introducing the convoy system. Supply ships sailed close together in large groups protected by British warships. Between July and August 1917, only five of the 800 ships bringing supplies to Britain were sunk. The war in the air. When the fighting began, aeroplanes were very slow, clumsy and unreliable. They were mainly used for reconnaissance. In August 1914, British pilots spotted thousands of German soldiers preparing to surround British troops on the Western Front. The British Army ordered soldiers to withdraw from the area in a move which may have saved 100,000 lives. In September, during the First Battle of the Marne, aeroplanes spotted a gap in German lines. The French and the British troops attacked the gap and were able to split the German army and drive it back. Enemy pilots would fight each other in the air. At first they fired pistols and threw bricks, but soon machine guns were fitted that they could shoot between the propellers. Pilots would take part in dogfights in the skies above the trenches. Every time a pilot shot down another plane, he claimed a kill, and those with the most kills were known as aces. Both sides used aircrafts to drop bombs on enemy positions. These bomber planes could only carry small bombs that the pilots dropped over the other side. So military engineers worked to develop aeroplanes that fly for a longer period of time and could bomb enemy cities. By 1917, the Germans had developed the Gotha bomber and began bombing British towns and cities. In one raid in June 1917, a 20-bomber raid on London killed 162 people, including 18 children, at a primary school in Chelsea. The British hit back with their own long-range bomber, the Handley Page. War in the air also fought by airships that were used for reconnaissance of bombing. Germans made the most use of the airships and developed one known as the Zeppelin. The Zeppelin bombed French and Belgium and British cities. Aeroplanes improved and it became easier to shoot down Zeppelins, so use of them declined. Russia leaves the war. By 1916, over a million Russians had been killed in the fighting and both soldiers and civilians had completely lost their enthusiasm for the war. By the beginning of 1917, discontent had turned into open opposition and riots and strikes broke out all over Russia. 
Soldiers on the front lines were refusing to follow orders, and many deserted. The Tsar abdicated on the 15th of March, and he and his family were immediately seized and imprisoned. The new government ordered a new attack on Germany in July 1917, which ended in a heavy defeat. After this, whole sections of the Russian army deserted. At the same time, the Germans smuggled Vladimir Lenin into Russia, which led to the Second Revolution in November 1917. Lenin and his supporters overthrew the government and declared that Russia was going to make peace with its enemies. March 1918, the Russians signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk with Germany and its allies. It was harsh on Russia, which lost some of its best farmland and natural resources. The British and the French were angry that the Russians had broken their alliance. Russia's withdrawal from the war meant the German Germans could pull their troops finally from the Eastern Front and move them to the Western Front. Germany no longer had to fight a war on two fronts and could concentrate all of their military power into breeding, 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 beating the British and the French. For those of you that don't know, the word breeding is used exclusively to indicate that you are eating cheese. You are breeding. The USA enters the war. When war broke out in 1914, the USA refused to take sides or to support any particular alliance. American neutrality did not mean that the USA remained totally unconnected to the war. American companies sold food, weapons and other goods to Britain and its allies. American banks also lent money to Britain and its allies, which were used to buy weapons and food, mainly from America. Ships transporting American weapons, food and other goods to Europe were a target for German U-boats. In America, anti-German feeling grew as increasing numbers of ships were sunk by U-boats. Following the sinking of the Lusitania with 128 Americans on board, many Americans demanded that the USA declare war on Germany. By 1917, the German tactic to starve Britain and France by sinking any ships sailing into British waters had resulted in eight American ships being sunk in just a few months. Demands to declare war grew louder and louder. The final straw, however, came in April 1917, when America discovered the Germans were trying to forge a secret alliance with Mexico, and they finally declared war on Germany following the reveal of the Zimmermann Telegraph. Entry of America was a great boost for Britain and France, and a devastating blow for the Germans. Although it would no longer be fighting a war on two fronts, it was racing against time to mount a counter-attack on the Western Front against Britain and France before more American troops arrived. We are certainly now moving towards the end of the war, and as a result there were new tactics and technologies used in different areas. For example, advances at sea. The hydrophone was a new technological breakthrough that helped to locate submarines. It is a microphone that can be used underwater to listen for underwater sounds. By 1918, hydrophones could detect submarines several miles away. Creation of the first aircraft carrier was another key development. In October 1918, a British ship became the world's first aircraft carrier when an aeroplane landed on it, HMS Argus. War ended a month later and the ship played no part, however, in the conflict. New tactics and technologies, tanks. The the first ever tanks used by the British were at the Battle of the Somme in 1916. They were slow, and most of them broke down before they could even get to the German trenches. However, in the Battle of Cambria in 1917, over 400 tanks crossed no man's land, crushed German machine gun positions. At the Battle of Armines in August 1918, around 600 tanks led an attack on the German positions. By the fifth day of the advance, less than 50 tanks were still working. By 1918, the Germans had developed guns that could punch a hole through the side of a tank and long range anti-tank guns, then could blow them up from a long distance. New tactics and technologies, infiltration tactics. In the early stages of the war, the standard method of attacking the trench was to bombard the enemy with shells, hoping to destroy their position, followed by a rush of troops in an attempt to overwhelm any remaining defenders. It was not successful many of the times and incurred heavy casualties for not much ground. The new technique developed in the later stages of the war, however, first suggested by the French, it was a process that specifically trained teams of elite soldiers armed with light guns, grenades, flames, throwers should advance shortly ahead of the main attack to locate and destroy any German machine guns. However, the Germans were the first to try this new tactic. They translated a captured copy of a booklet detailing the technique. This technique resulted in high casualties. A later version saw soldiers sneaking towards the enemy, often crawling in an attempt to get as near as possible to the enemy before attacking in key areas such as control or artillery placements. In 1917, Germans began training small units of soldiers in this new method of attack. The Germans called 
called an Storman, which means Storm Man, but is usually translated into Stormtrooper. By 1917, in September, Stormtroopers used successfully at the Battle of Riga on the Eastern Front, used again during the battles of Caparato and Cambrai. Troops from other countries adopted similar tactics known as infiltration tactics. New Tactics and Technology – Air Warfare At the start of the war, aeroplanes were mainly used for reconnaissance, but over the next four years, air warfare developed at a fast pace. Aeroplanes constructed with stronger materials and so became more manoeuvrable. Anthony Fokker, working for the Germans, developed the first synchronised mechanism that allowed machine guns mounted on the front to fire between the propellers. Stronger planes meant that they could have larger fuel tanks so they could travel greater distances. They could hold larger bombs and bomb racks for multiple bombs. They were made for long-range attacks more possible. Aeroplanes could even carry torpedoes to attack enemy submarines or warships. At first, aeroplanes flew, either alone or in small groups of two or three. By 1917, pilots were flying in large patrols or formations. In 1917, pilots could communicate with ground troops by the radio, rather than dropping weighted messages. New tactics and technology, artillery. Several improvements were made to artillery guns, shells and tactics. By the end of the war, special shells were developed that could destroy barbed wire and explode on contact with the ground. The creeping barrage was perfected. Anti-aircraft guns were developed to shoot down enemy planes. Guns became a lot bigger and more accurate. By March 1918, the Germans had developed guns that could fire 160 kilogram shell up to 130 kilometers or about 80 miles. Mine warfare or mining had become increasingly used. Tunnels were built, usually by ex-miners, under the enemy trenches so that explosives could be placed and blow up to destroy a key location. Commanding the troops. By March 1918, as the Ludendorff Spring Offensive threatened to completely overwhelm the British and French lines, a crucial decision was made. It was clear that better coordination between the different commanders was essential to deal with the German breakthrough. In a series of meetings, Allied generals and politicians agreed that there would be a commander-in-chief who would plan and direct all of the British, French and American troops against the German army. This was known as a unified command structure. Ferdinand Fock, an experienced and well-respected French general, was chosen. Ludendorff Spring Offensive Following the withdrawal from Russia, the Germans decided to gamble everything on an all-out attack to win the war before American troops arrived en masse. General Ludendorff devised a plan to attack at several points along the British and French lines. The main attack would happen near Arras. Trenches were not particularly well built here and Germans hoped to exploit this weak point. Attack would start with an intense 5 alloa artillery bombardment known as a hurricane bombardment. Germans planned to fire 1 million artillery shells at the British lines, over 3,000 shells per minute. Germans would use stormtroopers to burst through enemy lines, create a panic among enemy troops, and the attack would take place in three other places and gaps in the lines would allow the larger German force to break through, surround the British, forcing a surrender. The French would also surrender because they could not fight without Britain's support. The plan is sometimes known as the Spring Offensive. The artillery bombardment began at 4.40am on the 21st of March 1918. This was followed by the release of poison mustard gas and then a massive attack by thousands of stormtroopers. The British were totally outnumbered and confused. Thousands fled or surrendered. By the end of the first day, 20,000 soldiers had been killed, 35,000 had been wounded and yet another 21,000 had been taken prisoner. This was to become the biggest breakthrough on the Western Front for three years. The stalemate had been broken. Between March and April 1918, the Germans had lost over 220,000 men and did not have enough soldiers in reserve to replace those that had been killed or injured. Stormtroopers had performed too well and there were too many men deep into French territory. Food and weapons took too long to get to the troops and they were running out of both. The German advance began to slow as the troops stopped in captured French villages to loot for supplies. The British and French troops also began to fight back and the American troops began to arrive. The German advance meant there was a bulge in their front lines which meant that they could be attacked from different sides. This is what General Fox did. By June, American soldiers were arriving at a rate of 50,000 per week 
and Fock kept soldiers in reserve. By the 15th of July, Ludendorff ordered one final attack which ended in disaster. This was their last major attack of the war. It had cost the Germans around half a million men and now the Allies were about to launch their own huge attack. The Hundred Days After stopping Ludendorff's spring offensive, the Allied armies quickly began to prepare for their own attack. General Fock decided to launch a series of attacks at different points which would stretch the enemy and wear them down to breaking point. British, French and Belgium and other Allied forces would attack along the northern part of the front lines while the French and American would attack in multiple places along the eastern part of the western front. Attacks began at Armin's on the 8th of August when British, Australian, Canadian and French forces broke through German lines. Allied losses were reported at 6,500 while the Germans lost 30,000 men and a further 17,000 were taken prisoner. General Ludendorff called it the Black Day for the German army. By early October the Allies had completely broken through the defences of the Germans and they were in retreat. As they retreated the Germans burned bridges, destroyed roads, cut down trees and poisoned water wells so advancing enemy soldiers could not use them. This collapse forced most of the German military leaders to accept that the war should be ended. The impact of war on Germany. By September 1918 Germany was close to collapse. A deadly flu epidemic sweeping the country killing thousands already weak from a poor diet and starvation from the naval blockade. On the battlefields Germany and its allies were close to defeat. On the 29th of September, General Ludendorff told shocked German politicians and generals that he thought Germany should abandon the war as hopeless. On the 28th of October, the German Navy was ordered out to sea to attack British ships. Sailors refused and news of their mutiny spread. The country was in chaos. The Kaiser had lost control and army generals refused to support him. On the 9th of November, he abdicated and secretly left Germany. So why was Germany defeated, you might be asked? The war at sea? The British naval blockade of Germany? Stopping supplies? The arrival of the Americans into the war, the failure of the Ludendorff Spring Offensive, the impact of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, the development of the tank, the defeat of Germany's allies, or the German Revolution and the abdication of the Kaiser. Thanks for making it to the end. I know it was a pretty long one today. I put some practice questions up should you wish to give these a go. Leave any questions you have in the comments if you're unsure of any of the content on what you would like to see next. Remember, these videos are here for your benefit. So if you like the video, then you know what to do. And if you didn't, then please tell me, how can I make them better? Do you think that Haig deserved the title The Butcher of the Somme? What do you think was the main cause of the First World War? Do you disagree with Lessons in History who says that it should be the Bosnian Crisis? What do you think was the main reason for the Germans being given the title runners-up of the First World War? I'd be curious to hear what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching Lessons in History, and I'll see you in the next video.